not feeling great, in part, I guess, because since January 12th, I've done about 38 events in 20 or more states, so I've been on the road relatively non-stop since the middle of January. That is both a thing that runs down your body, but it's also a high-class problem to have. And I'm certainly not complaining about it, because what it suggests is that there are schools and students and faculty and administrators and community members all over this country who are concerned enough about some of the issues that face us as a nation when it comes to racial equity and justice or injustice as its opposite. That they will schedule events such as this and bring not just myself but several other folks with whom I work uh, and uh, organize around the country to speak to these issues and so it is important for us to come even when we don't feel good. It is important for us to be here even when uh, we're not at our best and to share what we can with you and to spark whatever dialogue we can as we go forward. I'm going to start off by mentioning a few things from the news over the last several months. And these things are perhaps at first going to seem perhaps a bit unrelated. You won't necessarily notice what links them all. You might, but in many cases you might not. But I assure you that all of these stories, all of these things about which I'm going to speak briefly, have something in common. And they speak to the challenge that faces us as a people in this particular moment of our nation's history. First, over the last few months within our political system, we have seen the rise of a political candidate who suggests that the best way that we can, quote unquote, make America great again, that is to say, apparently we're not great anymore, we were once upon a time, great, one wonders when exactly that was. What year, what decade, what era were we great and suddenly we have fallen backward. But this candidate says that in order to make America great, we should construct a wall to keep out certain people. That wall will only exist, of course, on the Mexican border. We are not apparently concerned about keeping crafty Canadians from sneaking over the northern border to take advantage of our superior health care. <laughs> There are no Minutemen sitting in boats off the coast of Nova Scotia threatening to shoot crafty Canadians who are trying to sneak in and take advantage of our superior economic policies and system. He says we must build a wall on that particular border to keep out those shifty, crafty Mexicans and Central and South Americans from coming to the United States to better their lives and those of their families. And that we should do more than that, that we should round up and potentially deport up to 11 million undocumented people, including children who were brought here by their families in search of a better life, much as many of our ancestors, certainly those of us of European descent, much as many of our ancestors did. But we don't see us in them, and we don't see them in us, and I'll have more to say about that a little later. And then we have another political candidate on the other side of the aisle, who, although she doesn't do that as the front runner in the other party, she stands behind, to this day, some of the very same policies, including trade agreements that helped to generate so much of the misery in Mexico that then forced people to search for a better life. When the North American Free Trade Agreement was passed in 1994 by President Bill Clinton, what happened? It allowed United States farmers to dump agricultural goods on the Mexican market, which did what? does what will always happen when you dump goods on another market. You'll drive down the price that, in this case, Mexican farmers and farm workers were able to get for their work, creating more misery there, which then leads those folks to look for jobs, first in cities in Mexico, and then continuing to move north. So if you have one candidate who wants to round up and get rid of the people made miserable by those policies, at least in part by those policies, right? and you have another leading candidate who certainly isn't seeking to make them miserable, but continues to defend policies that help to do that, then you know we as a people have a problem in our political system that we have a system that is far too cavalier about pain, far too willing to remain indifferent to the suffering of others. That's not to say that there aren't real differences between parties and candidates. Please don't misread what I'm saying. It is to say that we live in a political culture where certain lives apparently don't matter as much as others. But that's not the only thing that's happened. Over the last several months, we learned that the governor of Michigan, in his infinite wisdom, and his party affiliates in the legislature in that state, and the city administrator appointed by him in the city of Flint, sat back and allowed, one might even say encouraged, the people of Flint, Michigan, to suffer massive lead poisoning as a result of shifting the source of their water supply from 
where it had come previously one of the lakes, to the Flint River, which everybody knew was poison and had lead levels that were far too high for human consumption. They knew this, they were told this ahead of time, and they allowed the switch to happen, affecting the disproportionately low-income and disproportionately African-American community of Flint. Again, a political system which treats some lives incredibly cavalierly. Third story. Over the last few years, we have watched one after another incident where law enforcement has reacted to the sight of black men and women, and also, I should point out, indigenous men and women, and Latino and Latina men and women with fear and overreaction, creating a situation vis-a-vis -vis black folks whereby young black men are today 21 times more likely to be killed by law enforcement than young white men. It is certainly not because young white men commit crime 121st as often as young black men. It is not because young black men threaten police 21 times more often. There was certainly no threat being posed by Tamir Rice in that, in that public park in the city of Cleveland, a 12-year-old child playing with a toy gun, something that I venture to guess most young white men in this room did at some point when they were children, never really worried that a cop was going to come along and kill you as a result because they believed that you were dangerous. I should point out that the city of Cleveland is in the state of Ohio, which is in fact an open carry state which is to say that you can walk around with real guns in that state because the lawmakers have deemed that that's an intelligent policy. But Tamir Rice couldn't play with a toy gun. And you might say, well, now 12-year-olds aren't supposed to have real guns. Yes, that's true, but the cops thought he was 20 when they first saw him. So they thought he was an adult with a real gun, which was perfectly legal in the state of Ohio, and they killed him anyway. And of course, his killer was not indicted, will not be indicted, has been cleared. John Crawford, outside of Dayton, Ohio, Again, I'm sensing a trend with the wonderful state of Ohio. It's not the only one. John Crawford, the third, shopping in a Walmart, picks up an air rifle off of a shelf, an air rifle that they sell at Walmart. And he's standing with it. He's sort of swinging it at his side, maybe thinking about purchasing it, talking on the phone. Right? Somebody sees him. White guy sees him and says, oh, black guy with a gun on aisle seven. Must be dangerous. Calls the cops. There's a black guy. There's a black guy with an afro in aisle seven and a gun. Okay, first of all, if we learn nothing else, let's get our black hair straight, shall we? It's not an afro. It was twist, all right? Google that shit. Just so you know. <laughs> and can we learn about black hair, please, without touching black hair? Can we do that? Can we learn about black hair without touching black hair? That would be nice. Certainly the African-American women in this room know about what I'm speaking, even if others are going, wow. Google that too. John Crawford standing with an air rifle. White guy assumes he poses a danger. They call the cops. The cops roll in. The officer lies. It says that John Crawford pointed the gun at him. You can see it on video. There's no such action. John Crawford never raises the gun. The cop comes around the corner, opens fire immediately. Crawford drops. He stands back up, dazed but not killed not mortally wounded. He does not pick up the gun. The gun is three feet in front of him, laying on the ground. The cop opens fire several more times, kills him. He, too, has not been indicted. Eric Garner choked out on the street in Staten Island, not resisting arrest. You can watch that video as well. All he did was question why he was being harassed for ostensibly selling loose cigarettes. That was the reason that they supposedly stopped him, though they found no evidence he had actually been selling loose cigarettes on the street in Staten Island. There were no cigarettes on him. There were no customers who had purchased them. But that was the reason they were called on him. They confronted him. He says, why are you always harassing me? Why are you always bothering me? And that causes the officer to grab him around the neck and engage in a neck compression that chokes off the blood flow out of the brain once it is stayed and compressed there, and he dies. That officer also not indicted. Rakia Boyd in Chicago. <coughs> She was shot by a bullet that was fired by an officer randomly into a crowd. She posed no threat. She died. There was no indictment. And there are case after case after case like this disproportionately involving folks of color. That's been over just the last couple of years, again, suggesting that at least at some level, there are certain lives that are perceived as mattering less than other lives. That's why it's been so important for black folks in this country and their Latino allies and their Asian American allies and yes, their white allies to stand up and insist that black lives matter and yet some of us who are white, we get freaked out about that, right? We get tripped out about that phrase, black, black lives matter. Whoa. What? But all lives matter. <laughs> yes, I know they need precious. 
I know, Buttercup. I get that. But you don't have to say that. You don't have to suggest something that everybody takes for granted. We've always known that all includes white folks. We certainly know that all includes cops. When you kill a cop, you go to jail in this country, or worse. The problem is it's certain lives that are devalued and not taken as seriously. And that's why you have to proclaim it. You have to specify that which gets ignored. See, America has a history of saying all and not meaning it. We said all men are created equal, and we did not mean it. We said all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and then we proceeded every day to alienate those rights on a regular basis. So we're going to have to understand when black folks insist, yeah, when y'all say all, we need you to put an asterisk at the end to remind everybody that that means us too, because y'all normally don't mean that. See, it's not black folks' fault that they have to specify that black lives. And let me just tell you, when black lives do matter in this country, I promise you all lives will. When black lives matter in Flint, I promise you all lives will. When black lives matter in Baltimore, I promise you all lives will. Because see, when that uprising happened in Baltimore a year ago after the death of Freddie Gray in police custody, driven around, unbelted in the van in Baltimore, knocking around, ultimately breaks his neck. And everybody talked about the uprising, got so upset, you know, when black folks quote unquote rioted. It's funny what we call a riot and what we don't. There have been 150, if we were being honest, riots on college campuses since the mid-1990s, where overwhelmingly white, overwhelmingly middle class and above college students decided it was appropriate to burn furniture, throw rocks and bottles at cops, all because of the outcome of a basketball game, or a football game, or a crackdown on underage drinking. But we don't talk about the cultural problem of white organized violence on campuses, right? During the beginning of the NCAA March Madness, I was on the campus at Michigan State the day they lost that first round game, which I assure you did not go over well in East Lansing. <laughs> they were playing Middle Tennessee State University, which is actually my wife's alma mater. It's about 35 minutes down the road from where I live. All of us were convinced. I mean, everybody, unless you go to MTSU, nobody picked them to win that game. Everybody's bracket got completely jacked because of that game. And if you tell me that you had MTSU, you like you were drunk the night you picked that, or you're lying to me now. I don't believe it in most cases, right? Or you got a relative that goes there, or you just felt like being different. But I was on that campus when that game went down, right? And as it was ending, I was like, I gotta get the hell out of town because Michigan State has a history of rioting. Normally, when they're in the Final Four, win or lose, they just start burning stuff. And the black students are like, we're not sticking around for this. They leave. Like they, they don't get in the middle of that. The Latino kids don't get in the middle. They're out. They're not here. They love to party, too. They love to celebrate. But they know they will get shot. They will go to jail. So the black folks are like, nah, hell, we're leaving town. We're on the other side of campus. Leave that to the white folks. And as they lost, I'm like, I, only good thing was they hadn't had time to get their Molotov cocktails ready. You know, they thought they were going to win that game. They usually print out t-shirts that talk about the riot. They have the date on them. They print them up two weeks in advance, right? That's a premeditated criminal act, but we don't view those folks as rioters, but those folks in Baltimore, oh my God, they're violent, they're out of control. They threw a rock through CDS. That's the problem of violence. That's the narrative. That's the rhetoric. But what do we ignore about Baltimore? Sort of like Flint. Back in the 1990s, a story you probably didn't hear about, but it speaks to this theme I'm trying to discuss tonight about how certain lives obviously don't matter, and that's why we have to proclaim they do, and how we have this indifference to the suffering of some, even as we would never allow it for ourselves. If you know the history of Baltimore, you know that in the 90s, there was a decision made by researchers at Johns Hopkins University and the Kennedy Krieger Institute using federal tax dollars to conduct what they call the lead abatement study. And the purpose of this study, a study, let me remind you once again, paid for in part out of taxpayer dollars and administered by the scholars at Johns Hopkins, one of our nation's finest institutions, certainly finest medical researchers that you can find. And what did this study do? They wanted to find out the impact of lead levels from lead paint on the blood of children. Now, here's the thing. We already know the effect of lead on the blood of children. We did not need another study in the late 1990s to tell us what that does both to cognitive development and also what it does for impulse control, things like that, things that are directly related to criminal acting out, right? criminal offending, quote unquote deviance and pathology. Right? We already know. We've got dozens of studies, hundreds of studies. We know, and yet 
Johns Hopkins said, no, let's do another study. And they decided what they would do is they would recruit families, almost all of them black and all of them by definition poor, and they would have them move in to lead-infested housing and then monitor the blood of children for several months after they lived there. Now, some of these families got lucky. They got placed into facilities, into apartments, into row houses, what have you, where most of the lead had been abated by a very significant method of lead abatement. So some folks got lucky. They got to move into the least lead-infested housing. That was about one-third of the kids and families. The other third, second third, not quite as lucky. They moved into a middle-level lead-abated apartment where they'd done some abatement but not the hardcore stuff they did for the first third. Right? And then the final third, really unlucky, was put into the most lead-infested house where there had been virtually no abatement done at all. And what do you know? After the study was conducted, we come to realize that the kids who were in the really heavily lead-infested housing did worse. Shocking. You paid for this. I paid, at least in part, right, for this. But we don't think of that as violence. You throw a rock through a CVS window. You throw a brick at a police officer who's there to occupy your community. We see you as dangerous and pathological and violent and out of control. But you destroy the lives of children for science. You destroy the lives of families for science. And you get another research grant at the end of the process. See, we're indifferent to the suffering of some, but apparently not others. In the last few months, here's an interesting different kind of story, and you're really going to get confused probably about what links this, but trust me, it's all part of the same mentality. In the last couple of months, you may have seen there's a video that went viral, I think right before, I think it was before the first of the year, it's been, it's been relatively recent, where a carrier plant in Indiana, carrier does refrigeration units, air conditioning units, I believe, right? They, uh, there's a video that goes around where the guys, mostly guys, and overwhelmingly white, working class men, who work at this carrier plant, right, are in the video, and there's a guy from corporate in a nice suit, right, gets up on the stage in whatever, like, auditorium or cafeteria they have there at the carrier plant. He stands up and looks out and with no apparent misgiving says, just so you know, we're going to be shutting the plant down and moving it to Monterey, Mexico, because we have to remain competitive. You know, we have to maintain our competitive edge. And, of course, the room explodes with anger understandably so, because you just told these mostly white men, as well as some white women, as well as some folks of color, that their livelihoods are about to be taken away from them, their ability to support their families. Some of them, the only job they've known, or at least for 10, 15, 20 years, right? That that's going to be yanked out from under them. And he says, you know, it was a very hard decision. And somebody in the audience goes, was it? Because it doesn't seem that hard. It seems like it made it pretty easily. And he says, but you have to understand, but... Of course, the problem being those folks who've lost their jobs are going to be encouraged to blame whom for the fact that their jobs are now going to Mexico. Well, some would have to blame the Mexicans who took their jobs. That's the rhetoric coming from political leaders and politicians. The Mexicans are taking our jobs. The Chinese are taking our jobs. But there's no magic magnet in Mexico or China that forces these executives to send jobs overseas and to shutter the plants in this country. Mexico doesn't have the power to make that happen. China doesn't have the power to make that happen. Those decisions aren't being made by brown folk. They're not being made by Asian folk. In China, they're being made almost exclusively by wealthy white men in corporate offices in nice suits like that one. But the guy who came into the carrier plant, they're not doing it to remain competitive. Carrier's parent company made record profits the last couple of years. They're not in danger of not being competitive. They made that decision for the sake of their shareholders, most of whom are not working class. They made that decision for the sake of their executives. They made that decision for people at the top. What does that have to do with the stories I told a minute ago about indifference to the Tamir Rices of the world, the Rakia Boyds of the world, the John Crawfords of the world, the people of Flint, the black poor of Baltimore? They all have something in common, even though that story is mostly about the pain being experienced by working class white folks. There's still an indifference, isn't there? There's still a cavalier way in which we think about that. We allow those kinds of things to happen without thinking about it. Well, companies have to be free to move their capital wherever they want without having to think about the consequences to people who have given their lives to communities and what's going to happen to them because in the wake of the recession, even as jobs have started to come back, let's make no mistake that average pay for those new jobs 
that people have found post-recession are still about 20% below the median pay levels that they were receiving before the recession. So people may be working again, but they're working for less. Their benefits are up in the air. Their futures are up in the air because we still have political and economic policies predicated on benefiting the few at the expense of the many. Both major political parties, to one degree or another, are implicated in that. This isn't a partisan shame. It is a bipartisan shame, and it suggests a larger political culture that is highly problematic. What they also have in common, at least our reaction to them, is a propensity to engage in cruelty when we are discussing those cases. You know, you go on any website, right, and you look at the quote-unquote anonymous comments after another shooting of a young black or brown male or female, or you look at the stories about Flint or about Baltimore, or even the story about these white guys at the carrier plant, you'll find all kinds of hateful rhetoric about how poor people and working class people and unemployed people are to blame for their own plight, how the poor in Baltimore had it coming, they're culturally pathological, they deserve whatever happens to them, how Tamir Rice deserved to be shot, John Crawford deserved to be shot, right? We rationalize these things behind the veil of anonymity that is provided by the internet or God forbid by something like Yik Yak. Right? The ability to say outrageous things and hide behind the veil of anonymity, never having to actually own our awfulness, that's part of a culture of cruelty. We can have disagreements about public policy and not engage in that, but that is what we do, right? And so we have to discuss this as a cultural problem because we are too quick to justify inequality. We are too quick to speak viciously of those who are at the bottom, to treat them as if they are hardly worthy of our consideration as fellow citizens, let alone human beings. And so in the last couple of years, I talk about this in my new book, the one that is now covered with germs. It's in that box. Right. I talk about some of the examples of this. Rush Limbaugh a couple of years ago referring to students who have to rely on school breakfast and lunch programs to get through the day in school in this country, telling them that, you know, even though it's tough in the summer because you're not in school, don't worry, there are videos online that can show you how to dumpster dive to look for food until school starts back up in the fall. That's the way we talk about poor children in this country. We have people like Ted Nugent, the washed up rock star, NRA board member and avid hunter who frankly would make even a pacifist wish that deer could shoot back saying that the poor are, his words, gluttonous, soulless pigs. Neil Bortz, another radio talk show host in the wake of Katrina, which contributed to the destruction, at least temporarily, of a great city, a city in which I lived for 10 years, New Orleans, Louisiana. Neil Bortz, referring to the people of that city, over a thousand of whom lost their lives, and tens of thousands of whom lost their dwellings, their possessions, and in many cases, their livelihoods, referred to them in the wake of that tragedy as parasites, as vermin, as human refuse, as, quote, the toenail fungus of America. And this is something that boosted his ratings. It didn't result in him being removed from the air. It didn't result in him suffering the slings and arrows of an audience that thought perhaps he had gone too far. Rather, it boosted his ratings, that level of cruelty. And so we have to think about what that says about our country. It demonstrates a cultural problem not just a problem of a handful of people. Why is it happening? Why does that happen? Because, you know, there was a time, and it wasn't that long ago, it was within the lives of maybe at least some people in this room, certainly within the lives of their parents and some of your grandparents and such. There was a time when we didn't necessarily speak of those in need this way. Now, there is a long tradition of cruelty regarding the poor, going all the way back to the colonies. I don't want to sugarcoat it. Going all the way back to the colonies, there, there were those who believed that the poor were poor because they, you know, had violated God's will, you know, that they were drunkards, that they were, you know, evil, that they weren't good enough Christians. I mean, that strain has always been there, right? But in this country, in the last century, right, from roughly the 1930s, maybe to the early 1960s, there was a, a respite, a brief period of time where we spoke about those in need, at least most of us, spoke about those in need very differently. Those who were unemployed, those who were poor, those who were struggling, those who were suffering, those who required turning to public assistance. Now I should add an asterisk to that because let's be honest, we didn't talk nicely about everyone who was in need. Certainly didn't have that level of compassion for the black and brown poor. 
or the indigenous Native North American poor. But for the white poor, at the very least, even though it was a racialized sympathy, there was this 30-year period where we understood that people were hurting, they were out of work, they were unemployed, not because of some cultural pathology on their part, not because of bad decisions, but because of an economic system that had been rigged for the benefit of the few and against the interest of the many, and that system had collapsed. And it hadn't collapsed because poor people made it collapse. Poor folks don't have the power to make it collapse. Right? And so, as a result, we had about a 30-year period where the government intervened to help folks in need, created jobs programs, created housing programs that literally built the white middle class in this country. FHA loan programs, VA loan programs, later the GI Bill benefits, right? Which we think of as universal programs that can benefit just about everyone, but in truth, that's not what happened. For the first 30 years of those programs, really, the only people that could benefit from them were white. There were a handful of exceptions to that, but for the most part, people of color were excluded from these government efforts, and white folks loved those programs, right? I mean, there were some who didn't. The rich didn't like them. The elite never liked any kind of government intervention in the economy, and they had reasons for that, right? If you're, if you're the wealthy elite and you've got jobs to offer, you don't want there to be alternatives to whatever job you're offering at a crappy wage with no benefits. You want people to be so desperate that they'll take whatever you got. And if the government comes along and says, no, we're actually going to have a program to put people to work building uh, roads and building bridges, which is what they did during the New Deal, or building schools, or building libraries, or building airports. You know, LaGuardia, for instance, was built during that time with government funds, at least in part, right, largely. Um, if we're gonna employ people to do that, you've given people an out. They don't have to work in the private economy for low wages and crappy benefits. So the elite didn't like it, and they continued to bash the poor. But the average typical person in the United States realized the importance of these programs. And then something happened, right? And we're seeing the effects of it today. At some point, that sympathy, that forbearance, that systemic analysis that said there are systemic reasons why people are hurting. There are systemic reasons why they're out of work. There are systemic reasons why they're poor. We lost that. And we began to speak of the same kinds of people in very vituperative and hostile ways. What do you think changed, let's say, between the 1950s when the overwhelming majority of the beneficiaries of FHA loans, VA loans, GI Bill programs, other government interventions in the economy were white and the present. Well, what happened, of course, is that even though white folks continue to receive the bulk of government intervention benefits, contrary to popular belief, the public impression of government intervention in the economy changed. Right? Sometime around the late 60s, early 70s, we begin to see media imagery and later politicians taking advantage of that assumption to push the idea that government intervention on behalf of those in need is just what you do for those people on the other side of town. It's what we do for black people. Maybe now people think it's what we do for undocumented migrants from Mexico or Central or South America. In other words, government intervention is for the losers, particularly the black and brown losers, even though 30 years before, we were taking full advantage of those same programs. The white middle class, like I said, would not exist except for government intervention in the economy. And yet we deny it, right? Those of us who are white, or many of us grew up in families where we want to believe, oh, we never had any help from government. Government never gave us anything. Yeah, right. Except that land you got under the Homestead Act in 1862. 240 million acres of virtually free land given out almost exclusively to white Americans. Nothing except that FHA loan, $120 billion in housing equity loan preferentially over a 28-year period to white folks when people of color couldn't get it. Nothing but that GI Bill benefit. Nothing but that VA loan, nothing but those programs, right? And keep in mind, government during that time when white folks were reaping all the benefits, government was huge. That's why it's so funny to listen to folks on the right talk about, you know, we need to go back to a time when government was small and taxes were low. What the hell time was that? <laughs> what are you talking about? I actually asked somebody that, right? I got a letter from somebody who identified themselves as a Tea Party activist back in 09, 2010, right? She said, I saw you on CNN, and you said, you know, the Tea Party was about racism, which isn't really what I said. There's a little more nuance than that. <laughs> but that's what she heard. She said, it's just about racism. I just want you to know, it's got nothing to do with race. It's about going back to a time when taxes were low and government was small. Let's make America great again. Right? That was essentially what she was saying. Right? It'd be like it was back in the day. I'm like, what day? Give me a year. You don't get to play this vague shit with me. Like, you got to actually pick a year. Tell me when things were good, please. And it didn't even take her three minutes 
She was ready with the answer, and I knew what the answer would be. I knew to a day what a year, I mean, what to a year what it would be. She come back, she said, 1957. Of course she picked that. That's the year Leave It to Beaver started on television. White folks love 1957. <laughs> Really, 1957 was awesome. Well, of course, it wasn't so awesome for black people. It wasn't so awesome for Latino folk or Asian American folk because they were still suffering the immigration policy restrictions that had been in place for decades at that point and wouldn't be lifted until 1965. It wasn't a real good place for an awful lot of women because of institutionalized misogyny and sexism and patriarchy. It wasn't a real good place for LGBT folk who were forced into the closet and forced to remain there during that period, but I guess for her it was awesome because government was low and taxes were small. But of course, that's nonsense. Government wasn't small, taxes weren't low. 1957, the top marginal tax rate in this country was 91%. That means that after a certain point, which was 200,000 for an individual, 300,000 for a couple, every dollar you made above that, the government got 91 cents of every additional dollar. It wasn't just the top rate though, there were 17 tax brackets that were above anything we have today, right? And then several that are where we are today and some that were lower. 17 that were higher than anything we have. So the idea that government was small, that's the same government that did FHA loans, VA loans, GI Bill, the Interstate Highway Program, which was a huge government program that also benefited pretty much exclusively white folks, at least early on, because it allowed white folks who lived in the cities to hightail it out, as we say in the South, to the suburbs where only they could live. It subsidized white flight. It made it cheaper. It would have been harder to get out there and relocate if you didn't have the government subsidizing the roads, right? So government was huge, and taxes for most people were quite a bit higher, but we didn't see it that way because the beneficiaries all looked like folks we might have at our family reunion. But as soon as those benefits became available to others as a result of protest movements, right, as a result of committed activism, as a result of the civil rights movement and the offshoots of the civil rights movement, then all of a sudden, we discovered our inner libertarian. Right? All of a sudden, white folks were like, oh, government is bad for you. Government intervention in the economy is a horrible, evil thing. It was awesome when granddad got that house and that job and that GI Bill benefit to go to college. But now, it's a problem. So what happened is that need was racialized, and we saw that in the 1980s, actually beginning really in 76, when Ronald Reagan ran for the presidency the first time, going around the campaign trail, he didn't win that election, of course, but going around the campaign trail during the primaries, talking about welfare queens in designer jeans driving Cadillacs to the welfare office. And he picked as his example of that a woman from Chicago, whom he usually did not name. Occasionally he would. Her name was Linda Taylor. She's not completely fabricated. She did, in fact, exist, but Reagan utterly lied about the extent of so-called welfare fraud that she had committed. He said she had 120 names and 35 addresses and 27 different social security cards and had ripped off the government to the tune of a million dollars. Actually, it was like two different identities, you know, three social security cards, and she made off with eight grand. And they caught her, which also goes to show that the system wasn't that easy to scam. Linda Taylor wasn't a very bright criminal in that regard. She didn't get away with much, but Reagan used her and lied about her profligacy because it stoked the narrative. I'm sure there were some white, non-inner city welfare fraud folks he could have pointed to. I'm sure there were folks in the hollers of Western, uh, of West Virginia or of uh, Eastern Kentucky. I'm sure they could have found some folks on the farm that were gaining uh, farm subsidies who were white, but that wouldn't have served the ideological purpose. He picks a welfare recipient from Chicago because it triggers certain ideas, and it worked. So in the 1980s and up until today, if you ask most folks to envision people on so-called public assistance, we know exactly what it is that we tend to envision. Even though, and I want to make this point incredibly clear to you, right now, if I were to ask you, for instance, how many black adults in this country, keeping in mind that there are about 27, 28 million black adults in all, out of the 27 or 28 million black adults, how many of them do you think are actually currently receiving what we call welfare cash benefits of any kind from their state government? What number, not just percentage, but what actual number? 28 million black adults in all, here's the answer. There are 237,000 black adults who receive cash benefits. 237,000 adults receiving cash benefits out of 28 million. You can do the math. We're talking about less, considerably less, right, than even 1%. We're talking about an infinitesimally small percentage of folks, and yet the image persists. 
So the racialization of need, the racialization of poverty, has led to a situation where our ability or our willingness to be cruel toward those in need, something we wouldn't have engaged perhaps 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 years ago, we engage regularly today. We believe that somehow it's people of color who are taking advantage of things like Medicaid benefits, even though two-thirds of all Medicaid spending in this country is spent on elderly and disabled white folks, not single mothers of color. Five out of six African-American folks in this country, and even larger percentages, six out of seven of all Latino folks, receive no SNAP benefits, or what we call food stamp benefits historically, and yet we believe that they do. In fact, you know what the biggest single group of folks who receive food stamp benefits in any given community typically is in this country? It's not black folks, it's not Latino folks, it's not even just white folks in general. It's a very specific, narrow demographic. You'll never guess what it is. The group that is disproportionately represented on the SNAP or food stamp rolls in most communities are people who work at Walmart. I want you to think about that. How is it that Walmart, the nation's biggest employer, and one of the most profitable companies in the history of the world, certainly in the history of this country, needs to have their employees turning to you, the public, to subsidize their low wages? Think about the irony of being this wealthy company whose six principal heirs, there are six members of the Walton family who are the principal heirs to that fortune. Five of them were born in, one married, and her husband died, she got the rest. Six principal heirs to the Walmart fortune, last names of Walton. You know what? They have so much wealth just between the six of them that they own the same amount of stuff. They have the same net worth as the bottom 40% of the American population. Six people over here, 128 million to 130 million people over here. They have the same amount of stuff. And yet they need you and me to help pay their workers in food stamp benefits because they aren't making enough to survive and feed their families. Every Thanksgiving you see stories about Walmart having to encourage their employees to have food drives, not for poor folks on the other side of town, but for their own employees, right? So that Jim will put some money in the bucket, Jim who works as a greeter, so that Mary who works on aisle six can get a turkey for her kids. But if this wealthy corporation whose six heirs have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 130 million Americans would just pay their employees livable wages, then you and I wouldn't have to pay for their SNAP benefits. Something wrong with that. By the way, do you know where the employees redeem their SNAP benefits? At Walmart. <laughs> See, it's a genius move, isn't it? $13.5 billion a year Walmart makes from SNAP redemption, a significant amount of that coming from the people who only need SNAP because the company doesn't pay them enough to survive. Right? That's the problem. We don't talk about that, though, because we're so busy blaming Mexicans. We're so busy blaming Muslims. We're so busy blaming black folks for taking our jobs. That's the best one, right? I got an email from a kid a couple, I don't know, six months ago. Right, it's all capital letters, so I know. Uh, <laughs> I, know what it's, I know what's coming. <laughs> he says, I can't get a job. And of course, he tells me why. Not because he's like unhinged and sends emails in capital letters, which if he did that to a potential employer, he probably won't hire him. But it wouldn't be that, right? It's because apparently the blacks and the Mexicans are taking all of the jobs, which I find a sort of interesting stereotype, right? Same people who will tell us that black folks and Mexicans are taking all the jobs are the same people who tell us that black people and Mexicans are lazy. Okay, which is it, Precious? Because you can't be both. Right, I don't ask much of racists because I expect so incredibly little. But the one thing that I do ask for is just a little consistency. Like the one thing I hate in racism is being a moving target. Just pick one stereotype. They're both wrong, but just pick one and defend it. You can't take all the jobs and be lazy. If you took all the jobs, you're the opposite of lazy. And if you're lazy, you didn't even take one job, let alone all of them. That's what we've been led to believe. And so those folks at the carrier plant won't blame the rich white folks who sent their jobs away. Folks at Walmart you know, won't blame a system that necessarily you know, requires of them a certain degree of immiseration and then public subsidy rather than asking about an economy that benefits so few at the expense of so many. Those are the things that we need to be talking about. There's one other thing, though, that really is at the root of this culture of cruelty that's not new. See, part of it's new, right? That racialization of need, which allows us to look down on the poor in ways we might not have 60 years ago. There's something else, though, and it's something very old in our culture. So this is a bigger problem, right? Because at least theoretically, we can push back against the narrative that it's people of color who are the 
ones sucking up all the government money and the ones who were in need. We can push back against that with facts, but here's the bigger challenge for us. See, the other thing that makes it so easy to look down on those at the bottom is not only not new, it's the fundamental ideological cornerstone of this culture. And I want you to think about what that is. What's the one thing that everyone in this room, everyone in this country, regardless of race, ethnicity, cultural background, economic status, regardless of your religion of upbringing, regardless of where you grew up geographically, what's the one thing that we've all been taught in some way, shape, or form? Either directly by family or maybe by teachers, if not by teachers, maybe by preachers, if not by preachers, by politicians in the larger culture we share. The one thing that we've all been taught at one remove or another is that wherever we end up, it's all about us. That notion of rugged individualism, that notion of the myth of meritocracy, the idea that if you made it, it's because you're better, and if you didn't make it, there's something wrong with you. That's the, that's the secular gospel of America. It's the, it's the creation myth of America. And we're all taught it to one degree or another, and we're taught it even though we know it's more complicated than that, right? We all know that it's more complicated. We all know people, I'm quite sure, maybe in our own families, who've worked hard every day of their lives, have nothing to show for. And many of us know people who were born on third base, think they hit a triple and have never had to work particularly hard in their lives. Right? And they'll usually stay at the top and the folks at the bottom will so often remain there. Very little mobility and decreasing mobility in this country, both in reference to our own past and in reference to those other nations with which we like to compare ourselves in the Western industrialized world. Right? So this notion of rugged individualism allows us to look at the people who don't make it and say, well, the reason they didn't make it is there's something wrong with them. It's a very pleasing belief when you've made it, isn't it? When you're doing pretty well, when you've got a good job and decent income, it's a nice thing to believe because it allows you to feel superior. I'm where I am because I'm so damn good. And they're where they are because they're not. But it's a pernicious belief because if we're taught that, in spite of the fact that it's pretty obvious there's an economy that doesn't work that way. Those guys that worked at the carrier plant, they work hard. Right? They worked hard for years, feeding their families and producing value for their company, and their jobs are gone, and they didn't do that. And the benefits that they may have to turn to have been slashed to the bone because folks decided we don't need government benefits because they make you lazy. So now they're really going to be suffering. They're really going to be struggling through no fault of their own. It's a pernicious ideology because if we're taught that where you end up is all about you, that it doesn't have anything to do with connections, it doesn't have anything to do with the origin of your birth, right? then it becomes very easy to look around and see racial inequality and decide people of color must be inferior because they're disproportionately down here. White people just must be smarter. Men must be superior. Women inferior. Sexism, racism become normal if you teach people that and then they look around and they see with their own eyes inequality. But how in the world can we believe it? In this country right now, the one-tenth of one percent, the wealthiest one-tenth of one percent, have the same amount of wealth as the bottom 90. Is that because we actually believe there's a few hundred thousand people that are that much smarter than the other 300 plus million of us? Surely not. There are 37 people in this country who have the same net worth as the bottom half, 165 million people. Who in their right mind believes there's 37 people who are that much smarter than the rest of us, including the vast majority of white folks. This isn't just people of color that get hurt by this ideology, right? Who can actually believe that the 400 wealthiest white people in this country have worked harder than all black folks combined? And the reason I ask the question is because right now the wealthiest 400 white people have the same amount of wealth in their possession as every black person in America put together. 40 million folks, and they have the same amount as 400 people. Anyone who believes that there are 400 white people who have worked harder than 40 million black people. There's nothing I can do for you. And yet this society encourages us to believe that. There are 62 people on the planet who have the same net worth as the bottom half of humanity, three and a half billion with a B, people. There's no way to believe there are 62 people who got all that stuff just because they're that much smarter. Obviously, it's a condition of birth. Where were you born? To whom were you born? And what kind of society were you born? But we don't want to admit that. We want to believe it's all about us. We want to believe in this notion of rugged individualism. But let me just say this, and let me be clear about this. There's never been such a thing as a pure individual in the history of the human species. There is no such being, let alone a rugged individual. You know why? Because humans are an intensely social species. 
We've never lived in isolation. None of us were raised on an island by a porpoise. Right? The only way you could be a true individual, let alone a rugged individual, is if you had no help, no intervention by other humans guiding your path. Right? So if you actually did grow up on an island raised by a porpoise, you might indeed be a rugged individual. You would also be dangerous as hell. And any of us who encountered you would not want to hire you. <laughs> no, we would need to run the hell away from you. Because you would be feral. You would be dangerous. You would have no language. You wouldn't know that it's wrong to eat other people because nobody would have taught you that. Right? None of us have existed in a vacuum. Right? We've all had help along the way. And some of that help has been about race. Some of that help has been about socioeconomic status, regardless of race. Some of that help has been about gender. Some of that help has been about being straight in a straight-dominated world or cisgendered in a cisgender-dominated world. Some of it's been about being able-bodied. Right? Think about that. My privilege isn't just white and male and rich. It's also about being able-bodied, knowing that I can come into rooms like this and never have to really worry how I'm going to get in or how I'm going to get out if God forbid there's a fire, right? That too is privilege. It's the privilege of being oblivious to other people's truth. I don't have to know the truth that disabled people embody and in which they live. I don't have to know the truth that people of color live as a man. I don't have to know the truth that women live even though I am helping to raise two of them married to one, right? But sometimes those of us in dominant groups, we ignore how oblivious we are. We don't want to own that or acknowledge that. We act like we know more than the people who have to know it just to survive. It's fascinating. I'm oblivious to calculus, y'all. You know why? Because I didn't take it. You know why? Because they didn't make me. And if they weren't going to make me take it, I sure as hell was not going to take it. I'm glad some of y'all did. Somebody has to do that. And I might take my hat off to you if you can figure it out. I just knew when I was a freshman in high school that wasn't going to be me. So I constructed my whole high school and college career never to have to take calculus. That's how genius I am. And as a result of never having taken it, if I were to stand up here and try to do it for you, any of you that had taken it would know instantly, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. You'd be like, hey, wait a minute. Didn't you just say you never took the class? Aha, exactly. I never read the book, so to speak. But see, that's what we do with identity, right? White folks sometimes act like we know when racism is or is not happening more so than people of color do. And we never had to read the book. We never had to take the class. Those of us who were men, sometimes we act like we know when patriarchy, misogyny, sexism, and rape culture exist, and when they don't, and we never had to take the class. Those of us who are straight or cisgendered act like we have a better sense of when straight supremacy, transphobia, cisgendered normativity is happening versus LGBT folks who live that every day, and we never had to take the class. Folks with money think we know more about the poor than the poor know about the poor. That we understand their culture and their community better, but we don't even exist in those communities, and we don't know very many people there. I remember back in the 90s, I worked as a community organizer in New Orleans in public housing for about 15 months, and it was a time when New Orleans public housing was considered the worst in America. I don't know who ranks these things, by the way. <laughs> Somebody ranked them and decided New Orleans public housing projects were the worst. They were the most crime infested, the most drug infested, the most dangerous. And I remember meeting a guy out one night I was sitting at, you know, at, a, at a bar, because it's New Orleans, so you know, you know, it's what you do, right? And I'm sitting there, I didn't want to have a conversation about politics, I don't want to do that, but you know, people will chat me up at the bar. Mm -hmm. And this guy asked me what I do, and I told him. And he then proceeded to offer, as so often happens when you talk about issues of race and class, he wanted to offer completely unsolicited advice. <laughs> Not for me, but for the people with whom I work, not one of whom he'd ever met, none of whom he'd ever known in his life, and none of their communities into which he'd ever ventured. And his unsolicited advice was this. He said, you know what we need to do for these people? I thought, oh, God, here it comes. And whatever it is, is not, I assure you, what we need to do for these people. Right? But I waited, and I braced myself, right? And I sort of held my beer in my mouth, thinking maybe I'd have to spit it on him. <laughs> And he said, what we need to do is have some of these corporate executives on St. Charles Avenue, which is the big you know, street that runs through uptown New Orleans and has a lot of the mansions in the city. We need to have some of these corporate execs and CEOs go into the projects and teach these folks how to manage money. <laughs> I swallowed my beer, nearly choking on it, and then proceeded to say something along the lines of, and I'm going to clean it up just a little. 
because right? I'm trying to be as polite as possible. I said something along the lines, you can probably imagine it was a bit more harsh. I said, surely you jest. <laughs> Send rich people into the hood to tell poor people how to manage money? You're going to send millionaires into poor communities to tell poor people how to manage money? What the hell? Give me a couple million, I'll manage. That doesn't take skill. Rich people don't even manage their own money. They hire other people to do that for them. They don't have to have any talent when it comes to managing money. They just got to have money that someone else can then make more money out of. Sending rich people. That doesn't take skill. You know what does take skill, I told them? What takes skill is living in that community on $365 a month in either earned income or perhaps food stamp benefits and maybe in some cases a little bit of cash from what then was called the AFDC program, what we now call TANF. $365 a month and keeping your children alive on that. That takes talent. And I didn't go to college with any kids who could do that. I never could have done it. None of those folks on St. Charles Avenue or Audubon Place, the richest street in New Orleans, have ever had to do it. Maybe we need to flip the script on who's pathological, see? Maybe we need to have a different mentality about who has skills and who has deficits. Because maybe the skill is in the hands of the folks who get by on less and can teach us something about how they survive in spite of that, see? But we don't have to know about that. We can remain oblivious. We can continue to bash the people who are poor. We can call them toenail fungus. There was a woman that I worked with during that time who lived in public housing. She was a quote-unquote welfare recipient. And on a Thursday or Friday afternoon, her oldest son was murdered in a drive-by shooting. One of over 300 black men killed that year in the city of New Orleans. Right? And on the Monday after that happened, she showed up to work. And all of us looked at her and said, you know, Donna, you don't, you don't have to be here. You just bury your child to take some time off, you know? That's what we would have done. And we encouraged her to do it. She said, no, I have a job to do, and I'm here to do it for the benefit of my community. This is someone that this culture tells me to look down on, to look at as lazy, and that's why she lives in public housing. That's why she receives government benefits, even though she has a job. So that's the thing, she had a job, she still couldn't make enough to get out of the projects. She had a job, she still couldn't earn enough to be able to support her family in a city where the expenses in various areas were quite high, right? She paid a third of what she earned to the public housing authority. We tend to think that public housing is free. People don't live for free in public housing in almost any instance. You have to pay 30% of your income, whatever you earn. Now, if you don't earn much, that's not much. But in her case, you know, she earned enough. She had to pay 30%, just like a regular apartment. Right? But we look at her as lazy. And there she was, coming to work after burying her child. And I sat there and thought, ashamed of myself, right, that there were plenty of times that I called out of work and refused to come in just because I didn't feel like coming in. Right? Just because I felt like I do right now. Or not even this bad. I'd just been out partying with friends and didn't want to come to work. And she just showed that even people who we look down upon sometimes have a better work ethic than the people that we praise because people who have good jobs and college educations, we assume, must be superior to people like her. See, that's the problem in our culture. We need to invert that process. But here's what we also need to understand, and I'm going to close with this, because I want us to all understand the stake we have in changing this culture. It's not just that we need to change it on behalf of black people or change it on behalf of Latino folks or, or even to change it on behalf of poor people. I want to suggest to you that the vast majority of us need to change this culture and this reality, because the vast majority of us are hurt by it. Maybe not at first. Right? The folks who are hurt by it first, often people of color. The folks who are hurt by it second, maybe poor white folks. But I want to suggest to you that it can come back and bite most of us on the ass if we're not careful. Here's how I know. A couple years ago during the recession, I got an email from a white guy named Jeremy. Jeremy writes to me, he'd been laid off and he was out of work for 26 weeks, which was true for a lot of People in this country, including millions of white people who were struggling, right? Out of work for 26 weeks, 52 weeks, 99 weeks in some cases, right? Unemployment rate around 10%. Keep in mind, by the way, these were people that were looking for jobs. We have this impression that, oh, when you're unemployed, it's because you're not looking for work. But the official unemployment rate doesn't even include you if you're not actively looking for work. So when we say that this is somebody who was counted as unemployed and was receiving benefits for 52 weeks, that's somebody who had to look for a job by definition in order to qualify for those benefits. When we say the black teenage unemployment rate's 40%, which it was even back in the 90s when the economy was quote unquote good, that means 40% of young black teenagers who are looking for work can't find it. This isn't about lazy, it's not about people not wanting to work. So Jeremy writes to me and he says, you know, somebody sent me an email uh, with a link to an article you've written about white privilege, right? And he said, I just want to say to you, I've been out of work for 26 weeks, where's mine? It's a good question. 
It's a damn good question. It's a fair question. And it's a question to which he deserved an answer, and I intended to give it to him, right? So the first thing I did is I said, look, Jeremy, first of all, I want to say how sorry I am for the predicament you find yourself in. That's awful. I've been there, man. I've had that experience of being out of work, of not knowing where your next, pay next paycheck is coming from, right? of not knowing how I was going to pay, in my case, my student loans, or how I was going to be able to afford rent. I said, so I get it, and I feel for you even more than from my past experience, because Jeremy, he was like 40 years old. He had a kid. He had to raid her college account and pretty much empty it out. He had to sell stuff on Craigslist just to make a little money. He was actually sitting in a public computer at a library, logging into his Gmail account or whatever it was, right? Because he had to sell his own computer. So this dude was hurting. And he wanted to know what I had to say to somebody like him. Well, first I said, I'm really sorry. And listen, if I had any idea how to connect you to a job opportunity, I would do it, man. I would do it. I just didn't happen to know anyone in his particular field. So I said, I can't help you. I wish I could. Um, but I am sympathetic and I feel bad. And I said, the only thing I got to offer you is an analysis. And you may or may not be interested in that, but I'll offer it to you if you want. He said, yeah, what the hell? I got nothing else happening today. Right? And I said, all right. So I'm gonna tell you what I think is interesting, Jeremy. When you sent me this email, I read it very carefully. One of the things that stood out to me, it wasn't just that you said you've been out of work for 26 weeks. And what do I have to tell you about your white privilege? You said the following, this was a pretty much exactly the word for word thing he said. He said, you know, this wasn't supposed to happen to me. I worked hard. I did everything right. I played by the rules. I didn't take vacations. I worked on the weekends. I worked 60 hours a week. There were days at a time I didn't see my children. I did everything right. I stayed in school. I did everything right. I played by the rules. This wasn't supposed to happen to me. And I said, Jeremy, when you say it like that, there's something about that that stands out. See, what he didn't say, but could have said is, I've been out of work for 26 weeks. That shouldn't happen to anybody. And I would agree with that. Right? I think we ought to have an economy that's predicated on getting people back to work as quickly as possible and providing them truly remunerative employment to make that possible. Right? Or, if there aren't enough jobs, providing them with a significant enough safety net to allow them not to have to work for low wages and crappy benefits. So I agree. 26 weeks out of work shouldn't happen to anybody. White, black, brown, male, female, whatever. Right? But that's not what you said, Jeremy. What you said was, this wasn't supposed to happen to me. The subtext of which, whether you intend it this way or not, comes across to me as a mentality of expectation and entitlement. In other words, I am better than this, but those other poor schlubs in the unemployment line who I have to rub elbows with every time I go down there to get my check. Right? Those folks didn't work hard. They did deserve to have it happen to them. You may not mean to say it that way, but that's what the very specific personal reference seems to suggest, and I said, it seems to me, Jeremy, that what's making this even harder than it would be anyway, because let's be honest, 26 weeks out of work sucks, right? It's, it's enough of a psychological stress and a material stress that sucks. But I said, what makes it worse for you, my friend, is I get the sense that you never thought it could happen to you and you weren't prepared for the possibility that it could. And here's the news flash. There isn't a person of color in this country who didn't know that could happen. There isn't a person of color over the age of 11 who thinks that hard work is going to be enough. You can be a black or brown child of 8, 9, 10 years old, and you already know that hard work and playing by the rules isn't enough because it's never been enough. And so I said, Jeremy, what it seems to me you suffer from is the privilege of obliviousness to stuff that people of color have always known. If you'd grown up around folks of color, they could have set your ass straight by the time you were 13. But you didn't have to learn this stuff. And now you're suffering for it. See, that's how privilege lets you down. So you may not feel very privileged right now, Jeremy, but you have the privilege of not knowing how the world actually works. And people who have that privilege can be very dangerous because they let down their guard to how the world works. People that have to constantly survive the worst that life has to bring, as James Baldwin once said, eventually cease to be afraid of what life can bring. He was talking about black folks and their ability to persevere in the face of oppression. But if you're not having to constantly deal with those kind of setbacks, you don't develop a thick enough skin you don't develop the coping mechanisms that other folks develop as a matter of survival. So you see this system of inequality, this myth of meritocracy, which told Jeremy that all would come good if he just worked hard. Everything would be fine if he just worked hard. 364 days out of the year, that works. If day 365 is the day you get that pink slip and get laid off, the other 364 don't matter. If you don't understand how the world works, might not be a big deal 364 days out of the year, but if day 365 is 9-11, the other 364 don't matter. Let me explain why I'm conjuring up that imagery right now, right? 
See, when 9-11 happened, I was actually in downtown Manhattan yesterday. I was staying at the Millennium Hilton that overlooks the memorial site. I remember very clearly, as some of you will, but many of you are a little bit too young to maybe remember very clearly sort of the way in which the media responded and the kinds of things that were being said in the immediate wake of that tragedy. I remember, though, very clearly watching television. I noticed something. I noticed that a lot of white folks and no people of color, a lot of white folks, not all, but a lot, and no people of color, were on television or in person would ask the following question, or were asking it to reporters in the streets when they would put the microphone in their face. They would ask the following question. Why do they hate us? Why do these people hate America? I don't understand. The reason it's important to point out the monochromatic nature of that confusion is because there's a root to it. You see, people of color have always had to know when folks hated them and hunted them. People of color have never had the luxury of thinking that other people saw them the way they saw themselves. People of color have always had to know better. Those of us called white, though, particularly white Americans, have had the luxury of believing the world views us just like we do as unicorns and rainbows and all good things. And come to find out that's not how some people view you, you're not ready. So when people ask that question in the wake of 9-11, why do they hate us? Why do they hate us? And we don't already know because we've never thought about it. Not to say that any level of hatred justifies the murder of 3,000 people, just like no amount of hatred in response justifies killing over 100,000 Iraqis and folks in Afghanistan in retaliation for that. But here's the point. When you've never had to think about it, you're not ready. And so when they ask, then we come up with really stupid answers that mislead us and make our lives more dangerous, not less dangerous, more at risk, not less at risk. So what did we do? We said, why do they hate us? You know what the operative answer from the top of the administration down was? They hate us because of our freedoms. The hell? <laughs> hate us because of our freedoms? Really, you think that's it? Who, who, who would say that's a very privileged answer, isn't it? Because only privileged people think they're free. Right? They didn't go to Washington Heights and ask that question. They didn't go to the South Bronx and ask black folks in the South Bronx, hey, why do you think they hate us? Because they know black folks in the South Bronx are not going to say, well, fool, it's all these freedoms. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? They didn't go to Pine Ridge Reservation and talk to Lakota peoples on Pine Ridge, poorest community in the United States. Because you know the Lakota, when you ask them why do they hate us, they're sure as hell not going to say, look around, fool, all of this freedom. See, so that's a dangerous thing, because then if you believe that, then you just got to go bomb people and kill people. And many of us who stood against that at the time, and we told everyone who would listen, and there were pitifully few, that if we went down that road, you could count the years and so we would create a threat that was far greater, potentially far more dangerous, far more unhinged, far less capable of being controlled than the one we faced 15 and 16 years ago. Folks laughed and they scoffed and said, oh, you're just anti-American. You don't understand. You've got to fight these horrible, evil people. We told you. We told you. You create a power vacuum in that part of the world, and what will fill that vacuum will make what is there right now seem like Disneyland. And by God, we were right. But when we don't have to think about that, we don't have to know about that, and then we send thousands of our young men and women off to die for that, right? Now to come back and suffer post-traumatic stress and the slings and arrows of a healthcare system that doesn't really take that seriously for them, right? And then we wonder why that happens. I want to tell you this obliviousness will kill you. It is dangerous. It is not functional. It will let you down. And so we have to change it. There was a study that came out three months ago, and it makes the point perfectly, right? What did that study say? It said, in the last 13 or 14 years, there's been this interesting uptick in suicides and heroin and opioid addictions and cirrhosis of the liver, which is caused by heavy drinking. Deaths related to those things among one particular demographic group. Very interesting, which demographic group? White, mostly men between 45 and 54 without college degrees. Now, why, I ask you, would that particular group be the most likely to have this excess death happening over the last 13, 14 years because of suicide, heroin or other opioid addiction, or heavy drinking. And why is it that that's happening to them but not to similar black folks or similar brown folks? Right? I would suggest the only way to make sense of that is that that's the very group that was always told if they just worked hard, if they just had a strong back and could lift stuff, that there would be jobs for them. And then when the economy fell apart and we created a global economy where either you move money around on Wall Street, produce nothing of value, or you work for low wages, 23% less than the jobs that you had before the recession. So it's either a service economy or it's a finance economy. And most people can't fit into the finance economy. So 
we know where most of them end up working, right? Ultimately, if you have an economy that is predicated on the notion that all you gotta do is work hard and have a strong back and then the economy shifts and no one ever told you that could happen and you thought that the hard work was enough, just like Jeremy, and then you find out you're 10, 15, 20 years away from retirement looking down the barrel of retirement with nothing to show for it and you don't have a sense that your kids are gonna be better off than you and you're not even better off than your parents were, so the whole American dream comes crashing down around you. The lie that the culture told, which every person of color already knew was a myth. At the very least, not necessarily a lie, but an exaggerated myth. And only a half-truth at best. At least people of color develop coping skills to deal with that and to persevere and to survive all of these generations. And these white folks don't have that, so they turn to the gun, they turn to the drugs, they turn to the drink. And then they kill themselves 200 to 300 ex 200 to 300,000 excess deaths among that group in 13 to 14 years. See, that's why we gotta fight these systems of inequality and this ideology of cruelty and this false mentality of meritocracy. Because at the end of the day, when it all falls apart, when it all goes to hell, right, and your life doesn't live up to those promises, and that's what happens when reality intervenes in a global economy that isn't based on the benefits of the many, it's based on benefits for the few. When you don't have the coping skills to deal with that, that's all you got left. We need a society that tells a very different story, one that encourages us to band together and to work together rather than fighting one another over the pieces of the pie that not one of us own. Because the vast majority of us don't own this pie that we're killing each other over, that we're fighting over, right? Black and Latino folks who are fighting it out in the streets of Los Angeles fighting over a pie they don't own, right? White folks, working class, and people of color coming from Mexico being encouraged to distrust one another across border lines and think that walls and deportation will solve their problems. That's not true. You build a wall with Mexico, how is that going to stop capital from jumping borders? Do you think that wall is going to stop carrier from moving their plant to Monterey? How does that work? Do you think the wall like, stops the pushing of a button to transfer money to a Cayman Island bank account? Right? You think carriers not going to be able to move their plant? No, they can still move their plant. Capital will always be able to jump borders, right? Capital will always be able to jump borders in search of the highest return on investment. Only labor will be chained to its country of origin. And basic economics ought to tell you that if you chain labor and don't allow them to look for the highest price in terms of wages, but you allow capital and goods to cross borders looking for the highest rate of return or the highest price for those goods, that the game is inherently tilted in favor of capital and against working people and not just for the brown, and not just for the black, and not just for the poor, but ultimately for all of us. And so this thing that I'm talking about, equity and justice, this is not charity. At the end of the day, this is profound and even radical self-help. Thank you all so much for being here. I
to make it harder to vote, right? So we're going to throw out Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, for instance, which the Supreme Court did a couple years back, a year and a half ago. What did Section 5 do? Well, it basically said that if a state that has a history of impeding certain people's votes, particularly people of color, a proven history, wanted to make any change in their election procedures, they had to get approval from the Justice Department. Now they don't. Now the Supreme Court basically said, ah, we can trust them. Everything's fine now. And then what just happened in Arizona, right? We saw what happened in Arizona, which is that that state, which was also covered by Section 5, by the way, it wasn't just southern states, it was also Arizona, right? Um, ultimately, in Maricopa County, one of the, if not the largest county in Arizona, 4 million voters, the registrar of voters reduced the polling places. From, in 2008, there were 200 polling places. In 2012, there were like 120. And then this year, they reduced them to about 60. So you had five and six hour waits. Now that would never have been allowed if the Supreme Court hadn't said, yeah, we don't need this Section 5. If they had proposed doing that, the Justice Department would have said, hell no, you're trying to make it harder for Latinos to vote. That's rather obvious because there's such a large percentage of Maricopa County voters. So the Supreme Court has made it harder to vote. Appeals courts have signed off on these ridiculous voter ID laws, which are ridiculous because there is no real significant problem with voter fraud in this country. There have been 31 cases in 15 years of in-person voter fraud. You can't steal an eighth grade student council election with 31 votes, but they're acting like, oh, you've got to have an ID to vote, but not just any ID. You can't use a student ID, but you can use a gun registration license. Yeah, because nobody would lie to get a gun, right? But you can't use your student ID because they say, well, you know, so students, will, they'll, they'll big fake IDs. Yeah, because I remember being 19 and thinking to myself, you know what? I need a fake ID. You know why? So I can vote five times. <laughs> what the shit is that? Right? So the Supreme Court is saying it's okay to make it harder to vote. At the same time, they're saying they're opening the floodgates of corporate money and rich folk money, right, with the Citizens United decision of a few years back. And so ultimately, we have to really change that. We're going to have to reverse the judicial precedent of those decisions, and we're going to have to move back towards a system that um, does not simply cater to the needs of those who have. And we're going to have to demand that the narrative change. And I think there are folks who are trying to do that in this country that are trying to push all politicians to speak toward growing inequality. Um, and I think, you know, interestingly, I would argue that you know, even Donald Trump, for all of his prodigious flaws, is speaking to that issue of inequality. And I think his approach to it is preposterous, and I think his scapegoating of low-income folks of color for that problem is especially preposterous, when in fact it was trade deals that we signed that helped to create that misery, so to then build the wall is sort of like setting, house, uh, setting a house on fire, blocking the exits as folks try to leave, right? So I would say it's an absurd solution to the problem. But even he is trying to speak to the quote-unquote loss of the American dream for millions of people. That's real. That pain is real. Uh, Senator Sanders trying to speak to it the same way, others trying to speak to it, but I would say Senator Sanders doing it with more integrity and consistency, though even there I think he could be better on a lot of things, certainly no perfect candidate. Um, and so we've just got to do better. We've got to demand of whoever our candidates end up being, and whoever the president of the United States, because there's going to be one. Somebody's going to be president, and it's probably going to be one of these people. So I mean, make of that what you will, right? Maybe we could get better candidate. I don't know. Maybe somebody in this room is a better candidate. Hell, I don't know. But what I know is that whoever wins, we're going to have to demand a very different politic. And I do think at the very least, one of the benefits of the last several years has been that issues of inequality have begun to come to the forefront. And I do think there's an opportunity for us to strike now while the irons are hot, so to speak, and really make these kinds of statements trying to link working class struggling white folks with working class black and brown folks and really create some solidarity where up to now there's been all this vitriol and all this contempt for one another. Next question, please, if there is one. Yes, ma'am. Um, I noticed a lot that, um, as a Latino person, I noticed a lot of the during Halloween and stuff, people dress up as Mexicans and Mexicans. Yeah. And also, a lot of people in uh, Eurocentric or American culture decide to combat the Eurocentric culture by adopting that Afrocentric culture, by getting injections or getting this up big that's when I know that people of color are always made fun of for this. So I'm wondering, what's your stance on appropriation versus Eurocentric assimilation? It's interesting. Let me do the first piece first. I think, I think we need to really have an understanding of what this whole you know, phenomenon of, of racist themed parties and racist Halloween costume image really does to folks. Sometimes people think we're being too sensitive when we criticize that, or you know, they accuse people of being PC for 
critiquing folks who wear headdress or you know who wear sombreros and supposed Mexican mustaches or put blackface on and pretend to be a rapper of some sort, right? But there's a reason this stuff is offensive because those things mock certain cultures. They don't represent those cultures. They mock them. They're about making fun. Blackface, if we don't know the history, we should. You know, it was a form of entertainment created by low-income, mostly Irish immigrants, to make fun of black people and to feel superior to them. It was about looking down on them because they, as Irish had been, and working class white folks generally had been crapped on. But this was a way to find somebody you could step on, right? So it was a way of demeaning the intelligence of black people. The fact that that may not be your motivation for doing it doesn't matter. That's the history. Mm -hmm. And so to tell people not to do that isn't about being PC. It's about encouraging a certain degree of civility and sensitivity and saying, you know, if the only costume that you can come up with is something that mocks another culture, you're not very creative. You know, if the only party that your fraternity or sorority can think of is one that demeans another culture, you're a crappy party planner. Right? <laughs> the hell's wrong with you? Like, Google can give you other party ideas. That's what the internets are for, folks. Right? So why do we keep doing it, acting like it's not a big deal? Well, it is a big deal, and it's something that we should have a conversation about. I'm not saying that when someone does it, the solution is just to expel them off the campus, but we certainly want to push back. And I feel like some people don't like being pushed back on the view that that is like oppressing them. You know, Like if I call their party racist, well, you're violating my free speech. No, I didn't say you couldn't do it. I just said that when you do it, I'm going to call you an asshole. That's my free speech. That's my free speech. You have the right to be an asshole, I have the right to call you one. That's how that works. It's a two-way street. And if I call you one, you don't get to cry that you're being oppressed or marginalized because I push back. That's called the evolution of human consciousness. We're now at a point where that's not okay. And if you don't like that, your views are anachronistic. You need to be the one to grow up and change, right? Not me. As far as the issue of appropriation, there's a fine line, right, between appreciation and appropriation. And it's not always easy to know where that line is. And so a lot of times we end up transgressing it and somebody puts us back in our place and checks us, and then we need to learn and grow from it. You know, I, there's nothing wrong whatsoever with white folks, for example, or anyone who is, let's say, African American, appreciating uh, quote unquote black culture. We need to have, however, a broad understanding of what black culture means, and usually we don't. Right? Our understanding of black culture is very limited. So a lot of times when they have those parties, for instance, that I was just referring to, right, where folks will have quote unquote ghetto parties, as if the sum of black culture is the quote unquote ghetto. Or they will have uh, tacos and tequila parties that mock Mexican folk as if the sum of Chicano and Chicana culture or Mexican culture, Latino and Latina culture is tacos and tequila. Ain't nothing wrong with tacos or tequila. I like both in moderation, right? But, but if that's how you understand Latino culture, then you're not really appreciating Latino culture. It's like going to Hawaii and thinking that your Hawaiian print shirt is, you know, now you understand the history of the people of Hawaii, right? <laughs> Like, who the hell does that? Like, if your dad takes you to Hawaii on vacation and rocks that shirt, you're like, make fun of them. They're like, holy crap. You know, that's not real. That's just, you know, it's not really appreciation. Um, whether or not it's appropriation is always sort of up in the air. I, you know, I think when I see, you know, when I see white folks who, uh, who attempt to rip off black culture, whether it's with the collagen, collagen injections that you mentioned, that, that, that isn't as common as some other forms of you know, it speaks to what a lot of folks in hip-hop culture refer to as you know, this phenomenon of everything but the burden, right? This idea that white folks can appropriate blackness, specifically through something like hip-hop, and never have to actually have the burden of blackness. Nothing wrong with appreciating hip-hop, but you have to be very clear, right, about where that culture comes from, to be very responsive of, to it and respectful of it. And some hip-hop artists who are white have done that, and an awful damn lot have not. And so if you make your butt bigger and your lips bigger and you adopt what you consider to be an appropriate black scent that you heard somebody tell you is how they speak in Atlanta, but you're from Australia, you might want to check your ass. Right? If, you, if, you, if you are a white college dude who becomes a YouTube sensation rapping about nothing, right? rapping about I love college, basically it's all about drinking and shaking his ass and getting with women, you might want to check yourself. right? There are, on the other hand, I'm not even going to mention his name because he's pretty much done now. He's not even, you know, not much of a career for him anymore, right? But on the other hand, if you're somebody who wants to become part of the culture and be responsive to it, right? Even if I don't happen to necessarily like your music, even if I don't happen to necessarily like the way that you bring it, but if you have a respect for the origins of the culture, that's very different. If you're a white person who's rocking locks because Bob Marley had them, and you got a t-shirt with Bob Marley and you thought you could do your hair like that and you don't actually have any connection to 
to either Rasta culture or the larger culture that has essentially been typified, at least in part here, stylistically by locks. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can sit around on the quad kicking your hacky sack all day long with your Bob Marley shirt, smoking blunts. That doesn't mean that you have the burden of blackness, right? So there's a real problem with that. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some white folks who are deep into, let's say, Rasta culture, who are deep into the origins of that and other aspects of uh, what we might consider Rasta culture, certain aspects of, of both hairstyles and other cultural attributes from, from African peoples, Afro-Caribbean peoples. But the vast majority of folks who are doing that are not those people. Because the vast majority of us who actually have an understanding of that cultural history and tradition would never think to do it, right? It's not that you shouldn't be allowed to do it. Like I said, you can be an idiot, you know? But when you, when you are an idiot, don't be surprised when somebody calls you an idiot. And when they call you one, you might want to think about what you did, you know? And so I just want us to understand that, that uh, being part of a multiculture is going gonna, gonna to create some tensions. It's going to create some misunderstandings. The key is when we screw up, just accept the criticism. Right? Just take it. You might not even think it's fair, but just take it and sit with it for a minute. And at the end of the day, you might think, well, that was a little harsh, it was a little unfair. But just give it some thought because the people who have paid and died to create these cultures... The people that have suffered as a result of how they look, and now you're going to appropriate their hairstyle, now you're going to appropriate their clothing, now you're going to appropriate the way that they wear their hair, you're going to appropriate the way that they, you know, uh, the size of their lips or other things that you think typify them, right? And they pay the price for that, you know? Every single day, they, they bore a burden for those things and discrimination, having to change their hairstyle when they want to get a job, right? Having to, to change, in some cases, having real conversations about changing their names, because those names are too quote unquote ethnic, too cultural, too black, too whatever it is, right? Like, to adopt someone else's stuff, to put a dream catcher in your rear view mirror, and act like your great great grandmother was a Cherokee princess when she sure as hell was not, <laughs> right? To appropriate those symbols without actually understanding the meaning of it is wrong. On the other hand, if a person wants to truly integrate themselves into that culture, which you know some white folks did with indigenous people, a lot of white folks in the colonial period ran away to live with indigenous communities and in indigenous tribal nations to get away from the colonial oppression that they were experiencing at the hands of their European compatriots. So a lot of folks did that. They were literally white in terms of their skin color, but they adopted the practices of, the cultural attributes of, the history of, the tradition and the struggles of indigenous people. And they became indigenous in the eyes of those nations. Now the government would later say they weren't because the government under the Dawes Act had to figure out a way to limit land claims to indigenous people. I did that through what's called blood quantum, right? Indian people didn't think of indigeneity as being about blood quantum. It wasn't about are you 1 16th, 1 32nd, 1 8th, 1 4th. That's the United States government's definition of what makes you an Indian, right? There was a time before that when there were plenty of people you wouldn't think of as indigenous who were fully such. But nowadays, we just take the trappings without the burden. We go to the powwow, you know, we put the dream catcher in the rear view mirror. We adopt the cultural practices of other people. So we're doing their yoga. And we're doing their you know, mysticism as we understand Eastern religion, which is also a very limited understanding of Eastern religiosity, right? We just take the easy parts. We don't actually want to deal with the difficult parts. That, to me, is when it's appropriation, as opposed to appreciation. One more real quick, and then I'll let you get out of here. Yes? Hi. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking and spending your evening talking with us. Sure. Um, so my question really is, when educating people on privilege and disparities that exist in society, one is always start with oneself when you're having those personal one-on-one -on -one or small group conversations. What I mean by that is if I want somebody to really sort of own their privilege and be aware of it, or own their biases, because we all have biases, we've all been conditioned right, to adopt certain biases about one another. Um, if I want you to own your stuff, I gotta put my stuff in the street, right? Because nobody wants to go first, right? Like if I'm the professor in the front of the class and I'm trying to get you to own your stuff, and I, I hold your grade in my hands, right? Who the hell is gonna want to be like, yep, I'm biased, yep, I got racial biases, and I got privilege? Because you might be thinking to yourself, man, that teacher's gonna jump down my throat. So I always tell educators, and I do it myself, when you want to have that conversation, you gotta start with you. You gotta own your own stuff. And that's not just for white educators, by the way. I've had this conversation with African American female professors in particular, because African American women who find themselves in scholarship positions oftentimes are the most um, 
ignored those who get the worst evaluations, right, because they have both the racial and the gender element of their presumed incompetence working against them no matter how scholarly they are. And I've heard stories from uh, black women scholars that one of the things that's helped them talk about this with their, their, their students in a way that isn't as defensive, in a way that allows people to hear it, at least enough to have the productive conversation, is by starting with their own privilege. And you might think, well, what privilege is that? They're African American and they're women. Well, no, they don't have racial privilege or sex or gender privilege, but they could talk about able-bodied privilege or straight privilege. They could talk about middle class privilege. They could talk about PhD privilege, you know, having a degree and being in that room as the teacher. All of those are forms of advantage that give them a certain degree of power. And if they start with themselves and then say, now I've sort of outed myself, I've come out of the closet as somebody who has unearned advantage, and I've told you how I got it, and it wasn't all earned. I also had mentors, I also had help. It may not have been racialized help, you know, but it was help. Somebody helped me along the way to help me get where I am. I just need you to own yours. It's a lot easier, right? Because then the person knows that the teacher's not going to jump down their throat or that I'm not going to. So I talk a lot about that in my books and a lot of my speeches. I try to actually discuss some of the privileges and advantages and, you know, things that brought me to the place where I am. Um, the second thing I even want to do is we want to make space for the complexity of privilege. See, what I did tonight, right, was not what a lot of people do when they lecture about privilege. A lot of times we talk about privilege and we just do it as this sort of compendium of, of advantages that privileged people have, and it's all good, right? This is all the benefits you get, being white. This is all the benefits you get, being a guy. This is all the benefits you get, being straight. And you can imagine if that's your message, if that's the sum total of your message, I can understand white, straight, men, middle class, whatever, being like, damn, why would I want to give that up? Right? Because we live in a culture that actually encourages us to take advantage of our advantage, not to give it away. Right? So even if you're a really good, caring, compassionate person, which I happen to think most people are, you could easily hear all of that about your advantages, and if it does convince you, if it doesn't convince you, you're going to not want to listen to you. If it does convince you, you're going to be like, damn, I mean, that sucks, but hmm, it's pretty good for me. So you're not necessarily going get to in, get involved in changing it. What I tried to do tonight right, was to point out some reasons why even the folks who have it, even the folks I'm trying to get to confront their own advantage, need to understand the toxicity of that advantage. To understand that for every advantage, there's a downside, right? Creating that mentality of expectation, creating that mentality of entitlement is dangerous for you. And it's not just white privilege. I mean, I think about it with male privilege, right? Because think about male privilege and what it does. What it, when we know what it does to women. It excludes them from opportunities, right? It, it creates glass ceilings in the corporate world, et cetera. It contributes to rape culture and the way in which we downplay the seriousness and the gravity of rape culture. But think about what it does to men. I'm not trying to say that it's comparable to what it does to women. Women are the targets of, of patriarchy and misogyny, so I'm not trying to flip you know, who's really the, the, the target. But I want us to understand that we as men are collateral damage of toxic masculinity. Right? We may not be the target of it, but we're the collateral damage. How do I know? Very simply. I have a best friend who has been my best friend since we were five. He was my best man at my wedding. I stood in his wedding. He was president of the student body. I was vice president. We were debate partners for a while. We were theater partners for a while. I'm a godparent to his kids. He's a godparent to mine. You get the picture. Friends since we were five. Best friends, really. And I go see him. He teaches in L.A. at Cal State Los Angeles. And he's lived out there since 1999. Every year I go to L.A. at least a couple times. And I stay at his place. He and his wife live in Pasadena with their son, who's six. And every time I go to L.A., he picks me up at the airport. I throw my luggage in the back of his car, and then we hug. Now let me ask you, how do we hug? How do you think we hug? You know how we hug, we're guys. So we do this, uh, uh, how the hell are you? Beating on his backbone like I'm trying to push it through his chest. Why? Why do we do that? Because when we get home to his place in Pasadena and I see his wife, I don't do that to Dana. I didn't go up to Dana and say, how the hell are you? It's been so long, right? Try to bruise her. Just give her a nice, gentle hug. One, two, three, release. <laughs> Very different. Why? Because heteronormative masculinity in this culture, which gives me enormous benefits and privileges and advantages, tells me that that's the way I hug another guy. That's sort of what I call the, I'm straight, really. I'm straight, really. I promise, I'm really straight. Tap on the back. It's what we do to demonstrate that we're real men because real men don't express tenderness toward other men. 
Real men don't hug, we don't cry, we're supposed to suppress our emotions. We do not show the same level of tenderness that we do toward women because God forbid we do, we will be marked as what? Not real men. Do you think that's healthy for men? Do you think that we are made healthier by bottling up our emotions and our caring and compassion and love for other men in our lives? Is that, does that help us? Does that make us healthier, stronger? Does it make us considerably sicker? See, I would say... Stuffing those emotions, stuffing that natural tendency to want to be compassionate and caring and loving across these lines of gender and sex and sexuality, right? That, that really is toxic. You bottle those things up, that doesn't do you any good. So in a way, even though it provides immense advantages, that kind of steely kind of, I don't let anything get to me, I don't cry, I don't break down, I don't show my emotions, certainly not tender ones, right? At the end of the day, I would say that also contributes to that excess mortality rate of those men that I mentioned, right? Who are being encouraged more than anybody to do that. So is there male privilege? Hell yes. Does that privilege come at a cost? Absolutely. Is there straight privilege? Hell yes. Does it come at a cost? Absolutely. Because we're constantly trying to prove our heterosexuality. And we try to prove it through some really dangerous mechanisms. Being tough, right, which can get you in fights, get you killed, right, sleeping with as many women as you can if you're a heterosexual male, which can make you a parent at a very early age when you didn't mean to be, or oftentimes even lead to death as a result of a disease that you might contract, right? So at the end of the day, it's not real healthy behavior. We need to rethink it. And I think if we have that conversation, right, then people who we're accusing of, because they feel accused, accused of having privilege can begin to recognize that there's something in it for them too to change this reality. That it isn't just a, a zero-sum game where I have to give things up so that you can benefit. I might have to. I might have to give up the expectation and entitlement mentality, but the things that I would gain from giving that up would be so much more valuable to me, so much more valuable to my children and grandchildren if I'm lucky enough to have them one day, that all of that which we're asked to give up and lose will seem like nothing by comparison. Thank you all so very much. For